So if you're not okay with being recorded, um, you're not really going to be recorded unless you like say something in public chat. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, this here was the branding. We're throwing that out because that was not a cool joke anymore. And instead, I'm going to put this thing in the bottom left-hand corner. I'm not a huge fan of it, but until design gives me something, it will be perfectly serviceable. So we start with a quote like we usually do. A computer lets you make more mistakes faster than any invention in human history. Um, same quote I used for the winter 2020 presentation. Does anyone know who the author of this quote is? Go ahead and say in public chat. Some people know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was this guy right here. This cool looking dude is the author of this quote, although it is inspired by another quote. Anyways, the check-in code for this presentation, uh, psych, check the shared notes. We're going to be using that format to share information between us. That way, instead of you having to like scrunch and look at the slides, you could just kind of go over there and copy and paste it. Because I love, we're all software developers here. We love copy and pasting. That's our life. Um, however, I have to also amend that and say the check-in code is currently not working. Um, go ahead and let me know in the chat if dev uh, fixes it. And I will try to keep an eye on it, but no guarantees. Um, so here's some prerequisites for this workshop. I tried to keep it as minimal as possible. Um, for the most part, you can go into the first half of this workshop with no skill sets whatsoever. Um, but let's go ahead and try out the polling feature. I'm going to put up a yes or no poll. Um, and I just want you to say yes if you have taken or are currently enrolled in CSE 12 or 15L. And I want you to say no if you have never taken those classes before. OK, well, I think we are fortunate in that most of us here most of us here have taken the poll, and most of us have been in CSE 12 and 15 now. Um, I'm not going to wait any longer, so, but those are the results. They're pretty good. I assume you can see them on your screen, right? Like it should show it in the bottom right hand corner or whatever, and then it should go away. Okay. No, you can't? Really? Okay. I hit publish. Anyways, it was like about 80% yes, so we're good. Um, yeah, that's unusual. I'll take a look at that later, but. It's OK. Only I really need to know the answers to that poll. And for some polls later on, maybe it would be better if I'm the only one who can see it. Anyways, um, so if you have taken these two classes, then you are fine. You, don't, you have all the skills necessary. And realistically, all you really need as far as tools is a web browser and SSH on your computer. If you have a Mac, you already have SSH built in. If you have Windows and you don't know what SSH is, um, things might be a little bit difficult for you in the second half, but I'm going to post a link to some instructions that can help you uh, install that yourself if you're feeling a little adventurous um, and want to come along for the ride. But I think most of us should be okay, so that's good. Um, here we go. Yeah, sorry. Pull out your eye clickers. No, I'm kidding. Doesn't hurt um, if you have experience with web languages, if you know what HTML, CSS, and JS are, and if you have C programming knowledge, which, of course, if you took CSC 12 and 15L, especially with Gary, you probably do. So all of that's good information to know. Um, and for extra credit, if you happen to be one of the rare souls that knows how to use GDB properly, and you know a lot of Linux command line tools, and you have experience with web dev tools, any one of those skills, um, some of these challenges might even be easy for you. None of those tools are required for this challenge, um, but it might make things a lot easier. So anyways, um, like I said, no prerequisites. If you don't know anything, it's perfectly fine. Let's go. All right, you ready? Let's hack ACM. I mean that. Let's hack ACM. Uh, and by we hack ACM, I mean I'll hack ACM. Let me pull up ACM real fast in my browser, because this is what you came for, right? Um, I'm going to go to acmucsd.co. That's right, not com. If you went to com, right, or I guess it, it used to be members.acmucsd.com, and if you aren't logged in, then, like, this is what the login page looks like. Instead, let's go to acmucsd.co, a minor typo, to go to my totally not a phishing site duplicate of the real acmucsd portal. 
Um, this is going to be our first task of the day. I will now hack this portal by um, trying to log in as acm at ucsd.edu. Look at that, it auto-completed it for me. If only it could auto-complete the hacks for me too. Um, but as you can see, if I log in, um, it will fail. And that's good. If I don't have the password, I shouldn't be able to log in, right? Uh, it's doing the bare minimum. Um, I will, in fact, also tell you what the password is, though. And let me go to the version of this that actually prints the um, actually prints the passwords in plain text, so you can see them in the stream. But I'm going to go to log in, and I'm going to try a password. Let's go try like um, I don't know, ACM rocks. It's auto completing it. Is it ACM rocks? I think it might be. Okay, that's totally the password. So the actual password is ACM rocks, and that's good. Um, but let's see, let's assume I'm, I'm a malicious actor and I have no idea what that password is. Let's go ahead and see if we can get past this login without knowing anything about the password. For example, maybe putting some weird symbols or characters that wouldn't normally go in here, right? If I, if I just type gibberish, it'll give me this message, login failed. But if I put in some characters it really isn't expecting, for example, maybe like this apostrophe or like a bunch of apostrophes, um, it might give me an unknown error. And when it gives me a different error, when it wasn't prepared to handle what it gave me, that's going to be my first clue that, hey, you know, maybe maybe this is actually vulnerable to something called SQL injection, which we'll talk all about what that is later. This is just kind of me doing an overarching view of the whole subject. Um, so let's say I know how to do SQL injection. And I'm going to zoom in here so you guys can really see what I'm doing here. Oh, let's go to the version that's plain text. Um, I'm going to, knowing exactly what I'm going to do, type in an apostrophe to escape the SQL injection, to, to escape the password field of the SQL query. Then I'm going to type the word or to indicate that I want to concatenate some logic to this. Then I want to check to see if 1 is equal to 1, which it is. And then I'm going to re-escape it. And let's see if this is sufficient to perform SQL injection on this website. Oh, it's not. Did I forget something? Is it like double equals? I don't remember how to do this. OK, it's not double equals. Uh, let me think real fast. Um, I'll just comment out the rest and see if that works. Hey, OK, I got it. <laughs> All right, we did it. <laughs> We're hackers. First try, first try. Anyways, um, so there we go. I didn't know the password, but I was able to type something in based on knowledge of cybersecurity that was able to log me in anyways. And so we're going to talk about how that happened. And we're also going to make you do it uh, too. So that's going to be fun. We hacked ACM. We met that goal. Uh, let's see here. OK, now you do it. Um, I want you to go to HTTPS, acmucsd.co in your browser. And I want you to get to that same login page. And when you do, I want you to try to log in to that login page with the string that I tried, which I'll go ahead and put in the uh, shared notes so you can have it. Oh, that was the problem. OK. I'm, I'm surprised I managed to figure out something that would work. Um, this string right here. So the link, if you want to click it in the shared notes, acmucsd.co. And the password I want you to put in the password field is that string that's right after it. So just copy that, put it in the password field. Make sure the email, by the way, is acm at ucsd.edu. I had to think for a minute. <laughs> and go ahead and make sure that that works for you. And uh, you know, if you get it to work, just go ahead and say, like, I hacked it, or whatever, in the, uh, the tabs. OK, sweet. We've got some people doing it. Some of you were probably off doing it while I was still showing it, so. A A yeah, there are other methods. There's a ton of methods to do this, and we're going to talk about all the different methods and more here on the horizon. All right, well, I'm going to go. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because this is just me, like basically showing you how to do it and making sure it works on your end. If it does work on your end, then let's keep going. Um, were you able to get this to work? Yes or no? We're actually just going to skip that poll because I already asked. Um, and I think most of us can copy and paste things. So let's talk about why this works instead. This is probably a more interesting topic because it should go without saying that the password to log in is not this weird string I gave you, right? It's not this 
you know, apostrophe or like the password was ACM rocks. That's something you can use to log in. So why is it that this string also works? Why is it that without any knowledge of what the password is, I can type this in and get in? And we'll talk about that. But in order to talk about that, we have to go back, not back to the future, but back to the past, to the seventies to be exact, to a decade of progress and technological innovation. You see, in the 70s is when many important advancements in technology were made. We put people on the moon. Neil Armstrong, whose birthday is August 5th, which is also my birthday. Fun fact. We also invented C. So we actually had real programming languages for the first time instead of that fake stuff that came before it. And we even figured out male hair perfectly and perfected it. And since then, it's been kind of downhill. So the 70s were very important for a lot of reasons and specifically computers for our topic of discussion, right? You go to the 70s, computers are booming relative to um, not existing, which they were 20 years before that. Um, they look like this, for starters. That's actually a hard drive, and I don't think his hand should be there, but that's a hard drive. So cool, honestly. Here's all the pros of this badass 70s technology, okay? Way cooler looking than hard drives nowadays. Like, that thing looks like a straight-up bomb. They're massively fragile. I'm pretty sure if you, like have a microwave running in the same room, like it'll just catch on fire um, because we hadn't quite figured out some stuff. Uh, <laughs> shut up, Ishan. I'm not looking at the chat. Uh, they have an average capacity of around 50 megabytes, which is the average length of a song nowadays. So that should tell you a little bit about how file sizes have increased. But back in the day, man, you know, that's 50 million bytes. That's so much data. You could do, you know, imagine all the things you could do with that much data. And honestly, at the time, it almost seemed like a solution looking for a problem. Who needs 50 million bytes? Who can fill up 50 million bytes? Not the person sitting at their terminal in the 70s and like, you know, um, on Wall Street or something, they can't use 50 million bytes because they're just sitting there typing commands. What company on earth could possibly use all of that data? Big Blue has a way. IBM, also known as International Business Machines, also known as Big Blue, uh, is the lead manufacturer of computers at around this time. They aren't anymore for some reason. Um, and they invented the first database. And databases were really the first usage of space in computers to the extent that like we basically, like 50 million bytes, we weren't really using that before. And then databases came along and then we were like, oh, we need even more than this. So here's how they invented the first database, basically. IBM went to their smartest person. Um, they basically said, hey, we've got we want ways to manage like a ton of data. We want you to write software and design software to manage a ton of data. And the super smart professor dude, who I don't remember his name, I'm doing him a discredit, was like, okay, yeah, no, I came up with this thing called relational databases. Um, it's super academic, it's super interesting and super flexible. And IBM's like, oh man, that's sick. That's so easy to use. So we hate it. We don't want to use that. Um, instead, we're going to do SQL. And SQL is basically the application of this concept that this guy came up with that is com almost completely different. Um, in many ways, way worse. Just harder to use, very clunky, very corporate, very enterprise-y. Um, and basically, it all boils down to the fact that if the tech works well, right, you can't sell technicians to your customers that need to use this database that know nothing but how to use this product, right? You can't sell tech support if the tech actually works. So they made things a little bit more enterprisey. Um, relational databases is the next step naturally. It allows storage of highly structured aggregate data. Um, looks kind of like this, kind of like an Excel spreadsheet, but actually nothing like an Excel spreadsheet because it's way more interconnected than that. You have multiple tables, not just one. That's what makes it relational. And they all relate to one another so that you can have um, instead of just like a grid of data, you can have like certain items in a table correspond with multiple items in another table, et cetera, because you can't do that normally. Um, that was the big key breakthrough, I think. Um, relational databases let you retrieve all that data at once, just manage all of it and organize it. Um, you can perform queries such as want every 
order in our system older than three days, there's a query that you can type in SQL, which stands for Structured Query Language, uh, to retrieve that. Uh, want to apply sales tax to every order based on location. So you know, if the order came from Nevada, what they pay is what they paid. And if the order came from California, then we want you to multiply that by 0.0775%, um, minus the percent. You can do all that. Those are all valid queries. They're one line. And if you're a technician, you can really do a lot. So how do you talk to a database? I already mentioned this. But the idea is, is in the 70s, computers look like this, right? So it's not like some website you go to to like drag data around and it's all material design and pretty and like easy to use, basically. No, 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 no. This is terminals only. Welcome to the 70s, which means everything you need to be able to do to manage that data, all those complex queries you can do, all of those have to be based on typing. Commands only, right? So SQL looks a little bit like this. Um, I don't know. I just kind of found this stock image and slapped it in this presentation to increase the file size. Um, we'll talk a little bit about structured query language. But really, you don't need to know that much about it in order to know how SQL injection works. So we're, this is going to be pretty cursory. Um, so as an example, we're just going to show you examples about of structured query language queries. Um, if you had a database of users and you wanted to fetch all usernames from that database, you could literally type something as simple as select username from users. And the console would just output all of the usernames in that table, where users is the table. Um, I don't think you can see my mouse here. And username is all the usernames from that table. Um, fetch all admin account emails. You can perform selective querying. So you can say, OK, select email from users but only where the access level of that user is admin, right? So maybe the query looks something like that. But honestly, now that I actually look at it, it's not that complicated. You know, It's pretty simple, pretty compact. And when you read it, you know what it is. You might not be able to write it. But when you read it, you can kind of tell what's going on, right? Select email from users where access is admin. That makes sense. Like, that's a sentence. And that was kind of what SQL was supposed to be at first, is English. Um, very quickly, it does not become that. But um, we'll see why some of these um, some of these artifacts from the 70s, all this querying from the terminal, had some interesting effects when SQL decided to move to the World Wide Web. Because after all, you look at web applications, and this isn't in the 70s anymore. We're fast forwarding a little bit, just so you know. Um, we're not in the 70s. If you fast forward a little bit, I guess the 90s. Um, websites are a thing, right? So you can go to AOL.com and get like shafted for internet. And that was a thing that a lot of people were excited about. Um, but eventually, websites got very complicated. Um, to use that buzzword from the 90s, Web 2.0, right? Um, they have to store data. They have to memorize the fact that you were there earlier. They have to. Um, like Spotify has to keep track of all your music and playlists and stuff. Websites have to store data. That's something you and I are very comfortable with. But back when that was a new concept, there were some growing pains, right? So, hmm, websites have to store data. And there's already this thing called relational databases that are perfect for storing data. So to everyone at the time, it seemed like a match made in heaven, the web and SQL. Just put them together. Like, it doesn't matter. Just throw them together. It'll be perfect. What could possibly go wrong? You're probably wondering how I got here. Anyways, so here is how the SQL injection attack works. We're actually getting to the attack part. You know enough to know how this attack works. So we imagine the back end of this website, the part that actually processes your login request. When you hit login and send your email, and, and password. This is what we imagine happens, right? We store the person's email, right? We say var email is equal to the requested email. And we also store their password. Like we say, OK, this is what they requested. And then we start building a SQL query out, right? We basically create a string with the query inside of it, um, select everything, right? Star means everything. So select everything from users. Basically, select the all the information about a user where that user's email is equal to, and then we pass the actual email that was given to us, right? 
And then we say, we don't just want to select the user if the email matches. We need the password to match too. So we say, where email is equal to email and password is equal to password, right? So there's a little bit of artifacts of having to escape it. Like we have the double quote, single quote, double quote, semicolon stuff at the end there. But the, the query is more or less readable. We're just saying select the user where the email and password matches what was given to us, right? And the beauty of this is, of course, if you have the email right and you don't have the password wrong, it's not going to return anything, right? So that would just be used to show you that login failed page, and that would be it. So that's cool. Um, so in JavaScript, we might run some code that looks like this. We basically run the query db database dot run query, and we pass that giant string in, and then it goes to the SQLs database and like runs that query and returns it into the variable result. And then we basically say, okay, if the result isn't null, which is to say something came back, if something came back, then we know that the email and password must have been correct. So we'll go ahead and log in. Um, otherwise, if it did come back null, then we failed. Login failure, and we print some message to the user, right? So this is how we imagine the back end of this ACM UCSD.co works. And that's actually exactly how it works. But what's wrong with this? What can possibly go wrong? Let's talk about it. Here's your problem. If you take email is equal to acm at ucsd.edu, which is what we're sending, and we submit the password to be that string that I had given you guys, that you guys had been using to log in, then when you formulate the SQL query, right, you have select name from users where email is equal to something and password is equal to something, you put in the strings that the user provides. And email is equal to acm at ucsd.edu makes perfect sense, right? But then for the password field, notice that it can't tell the difference between what was passed and actual SQL instructions, right? So you see there, it's still highlighted in green like it's a string. But when the SQL processor reads it, it's actually going to interpret it like this, where the string actually ends immediately, right? It's just an empty string. Or one is equal to one, right? And so, of course, if you evaluate this, password is equal to empty string. That part is false. But the second part, where or 1 equals 1, 1 equals 1 is obviously true. It's just a trivially true statement. We could put any trivial, trivially true statement there, and it would evaluate so that it's true. Doesn't matter if we got the password right. False or true, if you know Boolean algebra, is just true. And then? No password required. Basically, you have manipulated the query from select name from users where email and password to just selecting from the email. But the code underlying it uses the SQL query to check to see if you had the password right. So if you just perform this query that doesn't check to see if the password's right, just by knowing the email, you can log in without the password. And yes, you can just put true. Um, I don't think true, like the keyword true is a construct in every SQL language. That's why we do this weird like one equals one thing. Um, there, there's a reason for it, but um, I know MySQL has a true, but like other databases don't. Anyways, we don't have to talk about dialects here. Um, hopefully that's simple enough to understand. Um, we'll get to more applications of this in a second here. The real heart of the issue here is that the website is not separating the query logic from the query data. If you pass data, it will try to interpret it as logic, which means you can change the flow of logic. But all things considered, it could be worse, right? If you were to like build the tier list of like worst things that could happen to you if you were attacked by a hacker, you know, things that could go horribly wrong when you're attacked by a hacker, someone logging in as you is A tier. It's really bad. You don't want someone logging in as you without your password. That's bad. But it's still not as bad as someone knowing your password, right? If someone knows your password, then it's almost like an invasion inside your own head. That was like the secret piece of information. And in many ways, it can indicate that they have a way to find out your password, whether it's they have like malware on your computer that's tracking your keystrokes, or maybe they just know a lot about you and know what kind of password you'd come up with. You know, um, And if you reuse that password on other websites, 
which you don't have to pretend you don't, you do, everyone does, then when they go to, when they have that password on that website, you can pretty much assume they have your password on every website, right? So yes, someone logging in as you is bad, but someone knowing your password is worse. So here's how you can take this attack from bad to worse. If you were to instead pass in um, a new query, if you were to somehow able, like if we could change the control flow of these queries, we could even change the query from selecting the name where email and password to selecting the password where the email is the case, right? If we can change the SQL query, we can change it in anything we want. In other words, we can make arbitrary queries to the database and be like, give me the password of this email. And then I can use it to log in, but even more than that, I have your password. You know what I mean? So worst case scenario, someone can go to a website that's vulnerable to SQL injection and just dump the passwords of every single person in their database, which is not ideal, admittedly. Um, here's the good news is that businesses don't store passwords in plain text anymore, right? So even if an attacker were to be able to do like select password from the database and get it out, um, they wouldn't get your password. They would get something else instead. Basically, they would get this thing called a hash, right? Um, if you were to perform select password, you would get this string of data that looks completely random. And this is basically your password, but it's been passed through a blender and turned into a bunch of random ones and zeros, right? Um, the benefit is that if you query the website to log in, all the website has to do is take your plain text password, throw it in the blender, and if what comes out matches the trash it has in its database, then that's the same as you having the password. They know you had the password without them having to actually store the password on their own end, which is good. Um, so it goes something like this. This is how you would change the vulnerable code from before. Um, instead of doing var password is equal to just the password that was requested, we actually go ahead and do an MD5 hash of that password instead, although you probably don't want to do MD5 anymore because that's vulnerable. But um, there are other password hashes. MD5 is the classic example. And what that does, MD5 is just the blender. It takes in the plain text password, and it spits out the garbage. Um, and then the benefit of this is also the password field is now safe from injection, right? MD5, that function, will only ever output um, basically a hash, right? So it'll only ever be alphanumeric, which means even if you were to pass in control flow altering things like equals and quote escapes and stuff, when it goes to the blender, all that's ever going to come out are letters and numbers. So there's no way for you to inject um, SQL logic into the password field. That's the second benefit of um, using an MD5 hash. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, the password is now safe from injection. And of course, the, the implication of this is the password is safe, but how safe is the email? It's time for level two. This is a challenge that's going to be a little bit more open-ended. Your goal, if you choose to accept it, is to go to acmucsd.co slash level2.html. I will post this in the shared notes so that you guys can just click it if you're feeling lazy like I usually do. Um, level2.html, there's the web page. And I want you to use SQL injection to get past the login. So if you actually open this, you're gonna get like a very similar page to um, the one you got before. It's literally just gonna look like this. Only it's gonna say, welcome to level two. And you're going to be able to do acm at ucsd.edu, and you're going to be able to do acm rocks as the password and get in. But I don't want you to get in that way. I want you to SQL inject this. However, and please ignore what I'm doing right now. I just want to make it clean, plainly obvious to you something real fast. Here we go. If you were to put the same string that worked last time, it's not going to work anymore. Login failed, right? Because this new level two is actually hashing the password. So the password field is no longer vulnerable to SQL injection. So I challenge you, you have roughly five minutes on your own to go to this web page and try to use SQL injection to get past the login, despite our new password sanitization. Good luck. Have fun. Uh, I'll type the email here in the shared notes. I'm also going to pause recording unless I answer a question. So, BRB. 
record here for a second. Um, for those of you who might be struggling with this, uh, here's your hint if you have programming knowledge in a language such as Java. In SQL, the characters dash dash, that's two hyphens, behave like slash slash comments in Java, meaning anything following those two characters is not interpreted as logic. So think about that and let me know what happens. For this challenge, um, thank you everyone who participated. I would love if you could answer a poll here in a second. Hopefully you guys can all see it, yes or no. Did you bypass the login successfully in the time that I gave you? And don't worry, I will, I will show how one can accomplish this feat. We have about 15 out of 23 right now. I feel like a Zoom professor. Like five people still asleep at the poll. All right, so it looks like about 43% of you definitely didn't. About 35% of you definitely did. And I don't know about the rest of you. So I d can you see the published results? I tried publishing them again, but I don't think you can see it. Yeah, OK. It was working earlier, so I'll just have to take a look at that. Let's go ahead and try to log in. Let's see here. Oh, is this level two? Yep. So anyone want to give a suggestion as to how I can defeat the password sanitization of this website? Inject the email field. OK. I like Ishan's suggestion. Ishan suggests three characters. That is to say, the uh, the apostrophe, and then two of those commenting dashes. And then what for the password? Something? Nothing? Anything? Nothing. Or anything. Like, right? You could you can make this whatever you want, but it doesn't matter, is the point. Because no matter what you're doing to the password field, you should be able to bypass the login just by putting those three additional characters after the email field. So let's talk about why. Actually, let me see if I talk about why. I don't even know if I actually talk about it. Um, I think I do. Yeah, OK. So fix one leak, and another appears. Um, here's our query, just like before. Our password field is safe. But let's go ahead and assume that we did what we said we were going to do. And we put an extra apostrophe and two dashes at the end of the email field. Now, notice how this gets interpreted when you do. Um, basically, it just comments out the entire second half of the query, right? Because anything that happens after two dashes is not interpreted at all. So you finish escaping the email field with the apostrophe, and then the two dashes just erase the password check entirely. And what you're left with is just give me the user with this email, and it'll just log you in. Done. Easy. Easy peasy. It's pretty fun, huh? Um, basically, SQL is so open-ended that there is no shortage of different ways to perform SQL injection on a, a vulnerable service like this. Like I think Storm said he found up to 10 in the time that we had, but that's just because he like ran a script on it. Anyways, um, so if that was too easy for you, then how about this? I know you're messing with the email field, so I'm going to put a stop to it right here and now. Here's the goal. Go to acmucsd.co slash not level 3.html because I knew you were going to try to go to level 3.html, so I made it not level 3.html, and use SQL injection to get past the login despite our new email sanitization. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and put in the shared notes that URL so you can go directly to it if you're feeling lazy like I usually do. Not level 3.html. The email is still the same. And I'd even recommend that you do the same thing to get past um, to get past the login for the second one. So do the email and then do the apostrophe and the double dash. And that should have worked, right? That does work on level two, but now it does not work on level three. And I will even demonstrate that this is the case right here live on stream. We're going to do some tricks. All right, not level three dot HTML. Same old web page you're used to. I'm going to type whoever cares in the uh, password field. And I'm going to go ahead and use our super secret hacking email. And when I hit login, ah, 
ha, I'm now checking to make sure that you enter an email address into that field, which means if you put some weird characters that don't belong in an email address in there, I block it. I don't even let you submit it. So what then? What are you going to do? You have five minutes to bypass my new email sanitization. Good luck. Badoosh. I'll go ahead and stop recording here for a little bit. How are you doing? All right. So my hint to you is, hint, level three is vulnerable in the exact same way as level two. Hopefully that doesn't give away too much. We'll find out. See you in a couple minutes. Welcome back, everybody. Um, Good job on that one. I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing that we did for level two. Just pass a poll real fast. Yes or no. Go ahead and respond if you were able to bypass the login successfully. And uh, say no if you weren't able to bypass my email sanitization. We have 13 respondents. I know there's 19 of you out there. Wow, we lost like four people from that one challenge. I didn't think it'd be that brutal. <laughs> this is definitely um, the challenge that it helps to have a little bit of web dev knowledge to do. All right, I'll go ahead and end the poll because I'm not getting any response from a couple of people, including someone named Daddy Aaron. I'm going to pretend I don't see that. About 47% of you um, said no. And about 35% of you said yes. So we definitely have some people who figured it out. But I'm just going to go ahead and show a couple solutions. There's many, many, many solutions to this. Um, and all of them pretty much use some web development knowledge. So basically, the problem with this, the reason why I said that I didn't fix the issue, not really, in this challenge, is because this thing stopping me right here isn't the server. It isn't the actual website stopping me. It's my browser. Just Firefox right here and now on my screen is what's stopping me from signing in, not the actual web server. And the way that this is done is if you right click on the email field and hit inspect element, this will open like the dev tools for your browser. And this is pretty much the case in um, Chrome as well. But basically, you get to see like the HTML of the page down here, right? This is the actual text that your browser is interpreting to turn into some pretty interface, when in reality, everything's just text, right? And you don't have to know a ton about what all of this is. But you notice here that this field, this input field that's selected, right? I said inspect this element, so it brought me to this input field. You'll notice that um, the type of this field is an email field, which is why when I try to hit submit, it says, please enter a email address. Now for the previous challenges, the type of this field was not email. It was actually just text, right? Which is still something you can type in, right? But the only difference is that it's not going to perform any checks to see if it's actually an email address before you submit the form. So doing that, just changing the type of it with inspect element to text instead of password is, uh, or instead of, instead of email, is one way to get past the login, right? If I go ahead and hit sign in, then we can see that I actually do bypass it because the problem wasn't solved at all. All that was was a instruction to my browser to say, okay, browser, you make sure that they only give an email. But the thing is, is the browser's running on your computer. You could just tell your browser to ignore that. You can change the input field type to just plain text, and then nothing's going to stop you. This isn't the only way to do it. Um, there's a couple of others. Here's a famous way. Um, also using development tools, Firefox supports the ability to replay requests. So if you submit a request to a web server, such as, hey, log me in, you can edit the fields and then replay that request. So. For example, if I go ahead and just do like email passwords blank and I hit sign in, um, it's going to fill up this network tab here. 
And the post request to login three is what I'm looking for, right? Um, that was the actual request to log in. We can see down here we have um, a bunch of stuff that's hard to understand. But the point is there's a button in this bottom right-hand corner that says edit and resend. And if I click that button, I can actually change my request to the server just as pure data without actually having to interact with the interface, just change what I actually sent. So I can just put the query directly in here. I can do like um, uh, the apostrophe equals equals. And then when I go ahead and hit send, it should log me in properly that time. It probably won't because I have to like actually HTML escape or like URL escape the thing. But like, that's another way. If you know what you're doing, you can get that to work is the point. Um, I think the easiest way to do it is just change the type of the field like we did the first time. So I'm not going to spend any longer on this. Just thought I'd show a couple of those off. So um, thank you very much for playing. Let's keep going. Let me check chat real fast to make sure. OK, yeah, just dumb stuff. Let's keep going. We're done with, actually, no, we're not done with websites. So I wanted to talk about client side versus server side, since that was the heart of the issue of the previous um, challenge. If the code is running on your machine, you own it. The only thing that the website can keep you from getting is the stuff that it's running on its machine. But the stuff that's running on your machine belongs to you. If you know what you're doing, despite the sandboxing, despite the DRM, despite how the browser hides the web page from you and just shows you the pretty parts, you can get your hands dirty, dig around with the nuts and bolts, and get it to do whatever you want. So client-side checks have zero security influence, right? Um, so they are trivial to bypass. However, server-sided checks, the ones like, for example, you know, is your password right? Those are unfriendly to the user generally. For example, if the check was on the server side to make sure that your email was formatted correctly and you got back a message from the server, like if it just failed your login, you would just get a page that says failed login and it wouldn't really tell you why you had a failed login. It wouldn't tell you that your email wasn't formatted correctly, right? Um, so there's a time and a place for client side checks and a time and a place for server side checks. But if security is important, you need to do server side checks. But more often than not, for any AAA production website, it is the holy matrimony between these two that gives you both the user friendliness of client side checks, doesn't even submit the query until you have it right, and the security of server side checks. So Always have both. I hear dumping stuff. Anyways, um, how about a demonstration? So people who watched this presentation during winter 2020 will recall that I paused for a minute here to go and hack the Regal Movies website. I can't do that right now, <laughs> not because I don't want to, but because the Regal Movies website is not letting you book seats because there are no movies playing because we are in the apocalypse. So I will not be giving you a demonstration. I will not be giving you the same demonstration that uh, I gave then, but uh, I'll have to do that some other time, perhaps. Thank you very much for playing anyways. Um, for those of you who are watching this workshop for the first time, don't worry about it. You aren't getting less content out of this workshop. I wanted to make sure that you had something to fill this empty space. Bye-bye, Regal Movie Theaters. Instead, I made an extra credit challenge that even people who are here during winter have not seen yet. It's not hard, so I think all of you can do it. Hope you get excited. Let's do this. Okay, this one's fun. I want you to go. Here's your challenge. Go to acmucsd.co slash inc, I-N-C, dot HTML, and use your knowledge, your newly gained, perhaps, knowledge of client-sided checks to beat the game. You only have about three minutes to do this because it is quick. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and post that link again in the shared notes folder. So if you just want to click it, you can. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to go ahead and show what that looks like, by the way, on the screen. Basically, it's this. Um, this is the game, so to speak. When you load it up, it says you are currently on level 1. And in order to beat the game, you have to get to level 1,000. So when you click Go to Next Level, it takes you to level 2. And then when you click Go to Next Level again, it takes you to level 3, and level 4, and level 5. And level six, I challenge you to get to level 1,000 in three minutes. Have fun, and I hope you brought your 
mice clicking macros with you today. <laughs> no hints on this one. <laughs> Auto clickers won't work. I'm going to go ahead and pause recording again. Check this out. I actually will give you a hint. And this will give it away. Hint. What happens to the URL in the bar at the top of your browser when you click the button to go to the next level? I want you to click the button a couple of times and watch what happens to that URL. Tor, shut up. Anyways, welcome back. Um, I hope you had fun there. I'm just going to go ahead and briefly show what's going on. Uh, if you hit next level, you'll notice here in the top left-hand corner, we have the URL, but we also have this number after the hashtag. And we notice if you look at that number, not the rest of the URL, but the number in the URL, every time you hit go to next level, that number increments. And in fact, that number matches the number of the level you're on, right? Well, you can just change what's in the URL bar, right? Surely. So if you just change it to, what, what do we need it to be? A thousand? If we change it to a thousand and refresh the page, boom, it tells you that this is the winning page. This means you got it. So ta-da. Yeah, don't use Internet Explorer. But that's uh, what the intended challenge is. The point is, is that the server isn't checking to see if you clicked go to the next level a thousand times, it's really just going to whatever page you tell it to. So if you tell it to go to page 1000, it will go to page 1000. Um, let me go ahead and do one more poll. I don't know if I actually did the poll for this one. Go ahead and tell me yes or no if you beat the game in the time that I gave you. Preferably, um, preferably, I think everyone. Not to shame anyone who hits no, but I think everyone just hit yes. So we're looking good here. <laughs> That's a fun one. I like it. <laughs> I came up with it in 30 minutes earlier. So let's go ahead and um, end the poll there. Everyone who responded, which is about 75% of us, uh, said yes. So congrats to everyone. Hope you had fun with that one. And kiss the web goodbye. We're moving on to a different kind of challenge now. We are saying goodbye to the first half of this workshop, and we are moving on to some different concepts. But they all relate. Security is all one thing. Um, let's move on. So before we do, we're just going to give a quick summary of SQL injection. Uh, this attack can be much more sophisticated than what we've gone over. The last one, really the last two we did weren't even SQL injection, but the point is, is that there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Sneak logic into fields that the website is trusting when it shouldn't trust it. Um, but most SQL injection attacks are prepared by or prevented by a concept known as prepared statements. Um, it's a link, but you can't click it because you're looking at my screen. Um, I'll post a document at the end with all these informational links and basically like a summary of all the challenges and the solutions. So you can look at it later and kind of like, you know, learn up if you want to do something like that. But that'll come at the end of the presentation. So just stay tuned. Um, injection, however, is still the number one threat according to OWASP, which is like the open web something. It's something having to do with web applications. Open web, web application security project, I think, is something like that. Um, it's still the number one threat. Um, An injection just refers to any time the server does not properly sanitize input that you give it, whether or not that's SQL injection. There are other types of injection, but... Um, Many of the most famous data breaches in history owe themselves to SQL injection. For example, here are some famous ones, or at least some cringy ones. Uh, the Michigan State University breach, in which 400,000 names and emails and addresses were obtained by a 17-year-old hacker from the Netherlands, who wasn't even really trying to hack Michigan State University. He was just scanning the web automatically and looking for websites that were vulnerable to SQL injection, and he stole... 400,000 names and email addresses. So you're definitely muted. Everyone's muted. <laughs> Welcome, Kendall. Uh, the Ubuntu forums breach in which 2 million usernames, IP addresses, and passwords were compromised from the official Ubuntu forums. Now, Ubuntu is an operating system, so it's a very high level of technical 
You know, like it's that's a technical concept, the concept of an operating system. So the fact that they were vulnerable to SQL injection means that no one is safe. Um, that's a lot of usernames. The, this one's rough. The Philippines Commission on Elections breach in which 77.7 million records representing the entire adult population of the Philippines was stored in plain text and easily obtained by a hacker via SQL injection. That one's a little rough. Um, oh, and here's one that probably affects all of us. The Heartland Payment Systems breach of 2009, for which hopefully all of us were alive. This is the largest ever breach of credit card data. Over 100 million cards, even the Equifax breach does not equate to this, uh, with an estimated financial loss of over $300 million to the organizations that are inside of Heartland Payment Systems and the organizations that relied on it. It was caused primarily by SQL injection. But these hackers were very sophisticated. They leveraged their access to the databases to delete system logs as they were stored. So basically, they would perform some illegal action, like downloading credit card data, and then they would do another SQL injection that basically removes the log, which is stored in the same database, so that there's no record of the exfiltration happening. So you can get very sophisticated with these attacks. Um, that said, I don't know how much credit you can give them because they were arrested after they posted about it on social media and had GPSs on their phones turned on. Uh, and then the ringleader was then sentenced to 20 years in prison where he currently is. So um, don't mess with the credit card industry. Break into Michigan State University. You'll get like a, a swat on the wrist, but credit cards mean business. So you ready for something new? We're actually going to pivot topics here. That was just kind of a fun little wrap up for SQL injection. Let's talk about binary stuff. This will be fun. Um, we're actually just going to start with a challenge right off the gate. We're just going to go ahead and jump right into it. Um, I want everyone to who knows what SSH is to SSH into my server here that I set up earlier this morning. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put this command into the shared notes so you can see it. Um, basically, your goal, by the way, oh, the password to this account, once you SSH into it, the password is going to be acmrocks1. And your goal, the purpose of this challenge, is to bypass the second layer of authentication after logging into the server. And by bypassing that, get the text, thanks for clearing level one, right? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put this command in the shared notes. That's level1 at acmucsd.co. The password is um, acmrocks1. And the other piece of information you might need for some of you who perhaps don't know what SSH is or don't have SSH installed on your computer, um, here is a guide that I wrote before coming here. Um, that's on Notion that you should be able to access that will give you a brief introduction to installing and using SSH if you are on Mac or Windows and don't already have SSH installed. But SSH is basically a way to get a terminal that you can type commands in on a server. I have set up a server, acmucsd.co, that will process your commands and give you a little exercise to do. And I will also show you what that looks like if you have SSH. So let me open up SSH. I went ahead and made my font super huge so you guys at home could see it. But if you can't see it, let me know. Oh, by the way, you guys have uh, how much time? Five minutes to do this one. But I'm also going to be good one, Bryce. <laughs> yeah, this one's not too bad. This one's usually one of the easier ones if you can actually get SSH'd in properly. Um, SSH level one at acmucsd.co. It's going to ask me for my password. It's going to say that. But then it's going to ask me for my password. And uh, when it asks me for my password, um, I'm going to type in acmrocks1. And it's going to immediately start challenging me, right? Oh, I've got someone's IP address here. I'm going to pretend I don't see that. Um, it says, your level one challenge has begun. The password is less than 15 characters. And it says, please enter a password. So if I type in acmrocks, doesn't work. If I type in ACM rocks one, it doesn't work. And it'll just keep querying me over and over and over and over again until I get the password right. So I challenge you in the next five minutes or so, if you can get SSH into here properly, 
um, bypass this second layer of authentication. I will see you guys on the other side. Actually, I'm just going to leave this open. Possible DNS spoofing. Yeah, if you did the challenge during the winter, um, if you did the challenge during the winter, it probably remembers, like your, your SSH tool probably remembers what the IP address of that domain was. And because it's not the same IP address, it's complaining. So just hit like past that and you'll be fine. Like just hit like, yeah, it's fine. Cause I get that too, but. Oh, does it not let you do it at all? No. Um, ah, okay. For me, I can just hit yes and like get past it. Oh, by the way, check-in's been fixed. So that's cool. If you want to check in now, I guess you can. Um, let me exit out of this. Yeah, it just brings up this warning. It differs for the key, offending host, matching key. Are you sure you want to continue connecting? I just hit yes. And that's it. So Arson got it. Yeah, with DNS issues, let me think. I mean, really, a Google search is going to be faster than me right now, but I can go ahead and Google search it for you. Um, I don't know what exact message you're getting. SSH, DNS change, maybe. Oops. DNS conflict. Um, if you're, yeah, if you're willing, you can just delete known hosts. <laughs> That's the fastest way. Or you can go into known hosts and actually like find the line and delete it. But if you're perfectly willing to just delete known hosts, which for most people is perfectly safe-ish, um, you can just nuke it because SSH will create a new one. If you do want to do that, then that would probably look something like this. rm um, squiggly line slash dot ssh slash known, known hosts. And that should do it. So if you, if you run into DNS issues, there you go. Let me know if that does not work. Yeah, you will you will be prompted for fingerprint confirmation on previously logged into servers, but for me, like I don't know, not that big a deal. Oh, I agree. So you can use um, Storm's code as well. I just don't use said enough to know that command off the top of my head. I low key just delete known hosts every time I have a problem. Probably not good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, some people are having some issues. Um, if anyone is having problems getting SSH working, I was also pretty expecting to have that problem. But I haven't seen anyone complain about it yet, so I guess my instructions worked or... They're just sitting back and watching, one of those two. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that the check-in works. Watch me get those points. Uh, was it hacker? Wow, look at that, guys. So if you haven't already, go to members.acmucsd.com and check in for a smooth however many points. I don't actually know how many points this is worth. All right, well, you get the idea. 10 points. Wow, this is valuable. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go ahead and say five minutes have gone by. I was pretty much debugging issues the whole time, so I didn't say, I didn't stop recording. I would love to take a poll real fast before I show the answer to see who managed to bypass the second login. And if you couldn't bypass it because you couldn't get SSH to work, that's perfectly fine. Don't sweat it. Uh, 
There we go. All right, we're looking at about over half of you managed to get past it. So this one's a little mean. Um, I'm going to show you what's going on. You don't need to know the password to bypass this login, to be clear. And I'm going to show you a way to do it. Um, if I go ahead and actually like SSH into the server, like everyone else, and I get past the stupid message, and I do ACM rocks one to get into the level one challenge, and it says, please enter a password. Um, Notice how it's very careful about telling me that the password is less than 15 characters. But I can make the password a hell of a lot longer than 15 characters. If I make it exactly 15 characters, let's see what happens. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. That's 15 A's. If I hit enter, it says incorrect. Well, I don't think the password's 15 A's, so that makes sense to me. What if I make it 16 A's? What if I make it a password that's longer than 15 characters? Oh, it it worked. Huh. OK. Well, that's kind of weird. I don't think the password's 16 A's, though. Let's go ahead and do it again, just real fast, maybe with something else. Um, ACM rocks one. OK, here's the challenge. Um, Let's do something other than A's, like maybe uh, H's. I don't know, just like a, a ton of H's. Oh, thanks for clearing level one. Huh. So for some reason, with this particular binary file that's written in C, when you give it a password that is longer than 15 characters, it will let you log in. And that might feel kind of arbitrary if you don't know a lot about how binaries work. That might feel like, oh, so what? You just like log them in if their password's longer than 15 characters. But we're about to go over the code and the cause of why this issue happens. And you'll see it's not as contrived as you'd think. This is a real problem that happens in production systems. And we're going to start talking about how we can avoid that in the future. Here we go. Let me check chat. Huh. Yeah, this one, this one, the password is less than 15 characters, but not really. Um, so a lot of us got it. Let's talk about what this code looks like. So this thing you're interacting with is written in C. So I'm going to write some C here. But C is fairly legible if you don't get into like pointer stuff. So I'm going to go easy on you guys. Also, most of you said you had taken 12 and 15 L, so I think you know what this is. Um, here's what the code probably looks like. We have an input buffer of characters, right? for the password or whatever gets entered in. We only have 15 characters. And we also have an integer called pass. And the way that we're going to use this integer is that if the integer pass is 0, then that's not logged in. And if the integer pass is 1, then that is logged in. And we're just going to use it to keep track of whether or not the person's logged in. So first, we print the statement to the user. This is what you got in your terminal. Please enter a password, right? That was the prompt. And then we run this C command called gets to get the input that the user provides on that line. That's everything you type, and then you hit Enter, right? Then we do what is in C called a string compare. We just check to see if the input that you gave us matches what the password actually is. And if that comes out to be 0, then we know that the strings match. That's just what string compare does, strcmp. That stands for string compare. Um, so if your password matches, we set pass equal to 1. And then later, we check, OK, so if they were logged in successfully, the password was correct, then we print, thanks for clearing level 1, and we return, right? That's how we imagine this program works, is it just checks for the password in this way. This is fairly standard. Like, there's nothing noticeably vulnerable about this. And then if they don't get logged in correctly, we print incorrect password, and we keep going, right? So take a look at this up here. For some reason, this is actually the problem. Um, and this, this is also the problem, this call to gets. Um, basically, it's a, a culmination of a bunch of very hard to see issues, unless you have an intimate knowledge of how memory is laid out in C programs. But even if you don't have intimate knowledge of how that works, I'm going to very clearly explain how this works. Okay. So what's the deal with gets? What does it do exactly? What's that function do? It reads characters from the standard input, stn, 
and stores them as a C string into the variable that is returned until a new line character or end of file is reached, right? So you hinting ent you hitting enter, that's a new line character, and that's when it's going to stop reading characters. So I want you to take a look at the conditions for this thing to stop reading characters. It stops reading characters only when it sees a new line character or the end of file, right? So the problem with that, does gets stop reading from standard in if it runs out of room in our buffer? Notice how this definition of the method doesn't do anything to talk about what it happens if it runs out of room in the buffer. And so we're going to explore what happens when it actually runs out of room. When I say runs out of room, I mean we have a buffer of 15 characters that we can fit the password in. But gets is going to keep reading into that buffer even if there isn't any more room into it. So no, it does not stop reading. So here's what happens. And there's a lot of animations on this slide. There's like over 400, so get ready for this. You ready? If you take CSE 12 and 15L, you're going to probably see a memory map like this. We create our buffer of 15 characters, right? And that basically creates this map of memory in our computer, in our RAM, that is exactly 15 bytes long, right? Each one of those is a character. And when we set int pass equal to 0, that is another variable that gets allocated somewhere else in memory. However, it happens to also just be right there, right next to the 15 bytes that we already had, right? So we allocate the 15 bytes for the input characters, and then we have another four bytes to store this password integer. That starts as zeros. We said that was zero, so there's nothing but zeros in those slots. But as for what's in there in the 15 bytes, we actually don't know yet until we actually read into it. So we call gets on our input. And let's say our input this time was what managed to lo uh, log us in, which is exactly 16 A's. So just imagine gets is reading in these A's one after another, right? It reads 15 of these A's into the slots. But what happens to the 16th A? Well, gets isn't going to stop just because it's out of room. It doesn't know it's out of room. So it's going to write A into the next available slot in memory which actually isn't in the input array, it's in get, it's in uh, the password integer instead, the thing that tracks whether or not we're logged in, right? So now that there is an A in this slot, is our pass still equal to zero? And the answer is no. And here's what happens, and here's the real big problem here. If our password, this check that we're making to see if our password is, see if we're logged in, um, we're just doing if pass, then print, thanks for clearing level one. But the thing you have to know about C is that if the password is anything but zero, right? If the pass is zero, then that is basically the same as saying false. But if pass is not equal to zero, then that's equal to true. So if we set some bytes somewhere inside that password to be not zero, then that'll return true, regardless of what those bytes are. That's why I can overfill the buffer with A's and get it to log in, but I can also overfill the buffer with any other character and also log in. So that's pretty cool. Sorry, someone's like banging on my door. I'm like trying to figure out what's going on here. All right, I'm going to ignore it for now. I think it's fine. Anyways, um, why does gets even exist if it does this then? If this is the core of the issue, if this is why when it goes to that statement, it logs in, even though we haven't actually logged in. If it's so insecure, if it's causing these problems, there was a time when gets was the obvious implementation. Like, um, yeah, it's not going to check to see if the buffer is big enough because you just don't call it on a buffer that's too small. Like, that's just up to the programmer and they know better, right? But the problem comes when the programmer passes the responsibility of passing responsible input to the user. Because if the user is a hacker, they are not going to be responsible, and they're going to type in something that breaks it. Um, besides, who would try to use gets maliciously? Gets isn't alone as far as functions that are insecure in the C standard library. In fact, um, there is a secure version of gets called fgets that basically does check the buffer, right? And this is something that came after gets. So 
it wasn't obvious at the time, but once it was obvious that gets had problems, they created F gets that basically checks the size to make sure you don't overfill the buffer. Um, there are other vulnerable functions such as string copy and mem copy that have secure counterparts, more secure counterparts. Um, and in fact, all of these are functions that are in the C standard library that are considered insecure because they don't do proper buffer checking. And any program that uses any of these calls in any context could possibly be vulnerable to buffer overflow, and which is the type of exploit that we just talked about. Um, and it's not clear that it's a buffer overflow unless you really, really look at it and start thinking about how memory is laid out in space and whatnot. So it's pretty complicated. Um, the question is, was this the only way to break this program? The previous challenge that we just did, was this the only method we could have done? Do we really have to cause a buffer overflow to be able to log in? And to answer that question, and the answer is yes, but that's because I didn't give you a shell. I just made you interact with the program as soon as you logged in. But for this next challenge, I'd like to give you a shell where you can enter in commands and stuff. You'll still have access to the level one binary, right? You'll be able to run it. The password for this new SSH session is ACMROX2. And your goal is to use Unix command line tools to tell me what the actual password is, right? Causing a buffer overflow doesn't tell me what the password is. Use Unix command line tools, if you know any from 15L, to tell me what the actual password is to the binary level one. And you have roughly five minutes to do this. So check this out. If I open up my SSH session and I SSH into soft hack at acmucsd.co. It will query me for the password after pitching at me for being in a different IP address. Then I'm going to type acmrocks2. And then I have a shell, right? I can do ls, ls, ls. Here's my shell, right? Clear. And I can do things like interact with the level one binary. And if I do that, I get the same level one challenge as before. I can put A's here and it clears it, right? But that doesn't tell me what the password is. The question is, do you know any Unix command line commands that can tell me what the password is? Can you analyze this binary now that you not only can execute it, but you can also read it? Can you tell me what the password is? And that is your challenge and you have roughly five minutes to do it. So have fun and I'll see you on the other side. And I'm gonna stop recording. Danny asks, why aren't the functions outright replaced? And the answer is because of what you said, compatibility. Um, people care about not having to rewrite their programs. Um, even though C is like 40 years old at this point, and or like close to 50, actually, I think it is. Um, C is very, very old. They still have not deprecated most of these functions and people can still write vulnerable software with them today. Um, there are certain things that have been done on the C standard library side of things to make this kind of attack less feasible. And I'll talk about those later, but in general, it's pretty difficult. Like um, the alternatives exist and that's good enough for the maintainers of C. It's like they want, they want the programmer to be able to shoot themselves in the foot if they want to, so. I guess that's <laughs> the C doctrine, so to speak. And yes, according to GNU, it is deprecated, but that doesn't mean anything. You can still use it. When you compile it, it'll whine at you, but people don't look at those warnings generally. Have fun, guys. Five minutes. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you very much for participating in this challenge. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take a quick poll to see how many of us were able to recover the shared password in the time that we had? You should see the poll appear on your screen now. Interesting, interesting. I'm loving this. <laughs> Only nine people have responded, 10 people have responded. We got seven more of you out there. I'm cutting it off. Poll in. Now is the time. I'm going to take this to mean that these other six people who haven't responded yet are, are like 
off in other tabs. They're playing Minecraft or something. They're playing on the official ACM Minecraft server. That's okay. I'm not offended. Just kidding. I know who you are, Kendall. Anyways, everyone else has voted. So um, in case you didn't see it, it's... Uh, <laughs> yeah, launch Friday is going to be fun. About... It was about a 50-50 split. Half of us got it, half of us didn't, of the people who responded to the poll. Um, so no worries. That is better than the first time I did this workshop, I think. So let me see what I can do. Um, let's First of all, I always love to see, after I give Shell access to a group of like 20 people, how many people just dumped shit in the console here. Oh, wow. The directory is empty except for level one. I always assume people are going to start like making stuff. But anyways. Um, Let's go ahead and see what the password is. Does anyone want to tell me what the password is, just so I can verify it? Less than 15 characters, remember? ACM rules. OK. Thanks for clearing level one. There you go. Apparently, that is the password. Now, a better question would be, how do you know that? Hmm. Well, there's actually a ton of ways. Strings is a good one. GDB, Lamau, strings, level one. Yep. A lot of us did strings. So the important thing to know is that in Unix, well, actually in computers, binaries, programs, air quotes, are just ones and zeros. There are They are files full of data, just like every other file on your computer. They may not be legible. You may not be able to see them. But for example, if I create a file that says like, hello, and I pipe it to hello.txt or whatever, and I go ahead and cat that file hello.txt, it prints the contents of the file. So cat is a program that will show me what is in a file. So if I cat level one, right? Now, a lot of stuff appeared on my screen because as it turns out, you and I are humans and we are not supposed to look at a binary. People who look at a binary are supposed to be the computers, right? The computers read the binary and interpret the instructions, they interpret the ones and zeros, and they run the program, right? However, if a program has text in it, plain readable text, when you go to look at the ones and zeros inside the program, you will see some readable text. Most of these are illegible. This is garbage. But if you actually, you know, kind of sift through this a little bit, you'll see some readable text mainly text that's being printed by the program. So your level one challenge has begun. The password is at 15 characters. I can read that part. I can read the thanks for clearing level one. I can read please enter a password. Oh, you know, this is the only piece of text that I don't see when I run the program. But somewhere inside this binary is a piece of text that says ACM rules. So just based on kind of half a hazardly dumping the contents to this file to my screen, and kind of just looking at it, I might be able to just pick out, hey, ACM rules, um, that could be the password. And if I do think that, let's see if I can clear my terminal. OK, good. Um, if I do think that, then I can safely do um, level one, level one, and do ACM rules, and just check it. And if it works, it works. So that's cool. Um, you can also, cat is a little half a hazard. There's actually a program built into Unix called strings. And what strings does is it goes through a file. It's like cat, but it'll only print the legible parts of a file. So it won't make a complete mess of your screen like cat does. Cat just prints everything regardless of whether or not it will display properly. But if you do strings, strings will only print the strings that it found. So it found all these random debugging symbols and stuff that we don't have to worry about. But if you scroll up and just look through this a little bit, you'll definitely see strings that are human readable. And you'll also see, please enter a password, ACM rules, right? So that is another way to find the password that's in this file. Um, you could also do it with GDB. Um, I'm not going to show that. GDB is kind of complicated. Um, however, GDB might help you on the third challenge if you're feeling lucky. So yeah, there we go. Um, that's how you recover the password or a way to recover the password, really any way of like going and digging through the binary and looking at the text that's inside of it can tell you the password. So here's my solution, my proposed solution. I'm going to write another binary that is different. OK, here's like level 2.c, right? This is the source code of the next challenge. So I'm doing the same thing. I'm doing the car and the inputs. And I'm using fgets, so it's not vulnerable to 
um, buffer overflow anymore, at least not the same kind of buffer overflow. And we use this check password to make sure that the password's correct. But notice here, I use an interesting algorithm to evaluate if your password is correct. I don't actually have the password in plain text anywhere. So you won't be able to strings the file and you won't be able to figure out what the password is. At least that's the hope. So with this new level 2.c, I invite you to SSH into level two, where the password is ACM rocks three. You will have full terminal access to it. And inside of that home directory, you will find level two, the binary, and you will also find level 2.c. I give you the source code. And my challenge to you is interact with the patched level two and get the phrase, thanks for clearing level two to, to appear. That's what I want, okay? Your requirements are pretty loose. But I'm giving you the source code this time because that's how confident I am that you won't be able to know what the password is. The password's nowhere in the source code, so it can't help you. Go for it. Uh, you have, oh, by the way, I have given you the source code level 2.c, and you actually have 10 minutes for this one because it's a little bit lengthier. But I'm going to drop a couple hints as we go here. So go ahead and mess around for a little bit and see how far you get. I'm going to go into shared notes and I'm going to edit the SSH details for you guys. There we go. And then the command you run once you're in there is level two. Basically the same program, but not vulnerable to buffer overflow. Bryce hacked it. Damn you, Bryce. <laughs> All right, well. For those of us who aren't speed demons, I'm going to leave you guys to it for a little bit. I'm going to pause recording, and I'll meet you back. I'm actually going to go downstairs briefly and get a drink, but I'll be right back, and I'll see you after the break. When I come back, I'll reveal the hint. Resume recording here. Here's your first hint. The first hint is, hint, more than one password will work. I'm actually just going to reveal the second hint now. Um, you can cut to the chase if you know how to use GDB. You don't need GDB to do this, but it might just let you fulfill the challenge requirements very quickly. Let me put it that way. <laughs> I'll leave you to it. So again, more than one password will work. We'll go for a couple more minutes now. Welcome back. I'm now recording once again. Uh, I put up the source code for some people following along at home. Let me see if I can unput up the source code. There we go. And we're back to our presentation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do the usual poll to see how many of us manage to figure out a password and get the success message to print in the time that we had, which was admittedly less than usual just because we were a little tight on time. We've definitely narrowed down the field a little bit. Eight o'clock is a little late for some people, so I respect that. All right, I think seven responders is what I'm going to get out of this, which is fine. Um, thank you very much. I would say of the people who responded, a fair number of you managed to get the password, so good on you guys, or get a password. Does anyone want to give me a password to try? Oops, I didn't mean to exit out of the presentation. Um, just give me a password that works. What is it? Level two. Um, do the usual yes, and then ACM rocks three. There we go. Interesting. So we have some different passwords, like I mentioned before. If I do clear, and I ls in this folder. Someone left me in a wool, so thank you very much for that. If I run level two, I can try a password. And I notice if I try more than 15 characters, it just tells me to go away, but three times. So definitely not vulnerable to the same problem. Let's figure out what the password is. Um, let's try some of these. I'm going to try Danny's password. Let's see if this works. Paste. Nice. Danny's password works somehow. Um, it's kind of... Doesn't look like it would be my password if I'm going to be completely honest. Um, but the Stormfire. Oh, you corrected yours. 
iPod. Here we go. The one with the three. Oh, neither one of them is right for me. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's like a chat formatting issue or something. I'm trying not to get the new lines. Uh, let's try. Yeah, you guys got two of the same ones. An extra Z. How many Zs are you going to give me here? Oops, I have to <laughs> launch the binary first. Let's try that one. Hey, there we go. All right. You got it, Storm. Um, sweet. So these are all valid examples. Uh, fun fact, the originating example is ACM rocks 13. If you do that, that is technically the password. But you don't need to know the password to be able to finish this challenge. It definitely helps if you have experience with C. And being able to read this code, I think, is a minimum to being able to solve it by getting the password this way. So um, basically, we have a check password function that takes in the password characters, right? And we are going to loop over each character of the password up to 15 characters. And we're basically going to take the numeric value of that character and add it to like an accumulated sum. And then at the end, we just check to see if that sum is equal to some number. And that's basically like some checksum that I came up with to verify if the password's correct. So it's kind of like a hashing algorithm, but it's a really terrible hashing algorithm because in reality, it is trivial to look at this, as many of you did, and find any number of passwords that works. I think a pretty normal way to do this is to just take this number, divide it by like, I don't know, the number of the ASCII values of a character such as D, figure out how many Ds can fit in there, and then fill the remaining space with a three, and then the sum is equal to 951, et cetera. Anyways, um, the point is, is that if you know C, you can kind of engineer a solution. However, if, even if you don't know C, well, actually, I shouldn't say that, there are other ways to solve this problem, hence why I mentioned that GDB could speed things up a little bit back here on the slides. Um, if I swap the presentation view and go back. Yeah, this one. You can cut to the chase if you know GDB. You don't even have to think about what the algorithm is if you don't want to. If you just want to go in here and run GDB, which, by the way, stands for GNU Debugger, it lets you control the flow of execution of a binary that's on your computer, right? Keep in mind, client-side versus server-side. This program is client-sided because you are in control of the ones and zeros that run it, right? So you can go into here and you can do something like, hey, now that I'm running this program with GDB, I just want to know what kind of functions there are in this binary. If I just type info functions, it prints a bunch of functions. So I get a bunch of symbols that aren't important to me. But up here, it tells me that there are two defined functions here. There's the main, which is the entry point, and then some function called check password. And I can also see that this function returns an integer. Now, let's assume I have no knowledge of the source code. Well, I know that there's a function called check password and an integer even without that. So let's go ahead and put a breakpoint. And of course, you have to have a little bit of CSE 15 knowledge to be able to follow along here. Um, but if you put a breakpoint at that function, hit uh, run to just execute it until you get there. It'll start the prompt. Please enter a password. I type in some garbage that is definitely not the password or long enough to sum up to 951. And it will break because basically the function check password just got called. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, I think check password is probably one of those functions that returns one if the password came out correct and return zero if the password is not correct, right? It's probably like an if statement somewhere, if check password, right? So here in GDB, we can just ignore the rest of this function. Basically, we're like at the top of the function. We're just going to hit like return one, just immediately return from this function. And it asks me, do you want to make the function return now? And I hit yes. And then it returns from it. And then I can just do continue to unfreeze. And it will print, thanks for clearing level two. And yet I didn't know the password. I didn't even look at the algorithm for what the password is. But using the GNU debugger, I was able to fulfill the program requirements, which very specifically said you only have to get the phrase 
thanks for clearing level two to appear. I worded it that way to leave it open to GDB people. So congratulations. Um, I don't, I don't, I doubt anyone did it that way, but just thought I'd demonstrate that for those advanced users out there in the audience. Um, so we're just going to talk about a few things uh, real fast here, and then we'll wrap up. Um, let's talk about some famous buffer over overflows in history. Uh, the Heartbleed bug, which is basically a bug in which um, the actual software that was in charge of securing your connections to websites across the internet, OpenSSL, happened to be happened to have a buffer overflow, and you could use it to get information from that binary that you're not supposed to have, information about other programs running on the machine, including people's passwords and keys, and you could decrypt it, and yeah, anyways, it was bad. Um, it's derivative CloudBleed, which was a version that specifically affected Cloudflare, which is like a giant distributive network, so pretty important that that's secure. Um, pretty much every jailbreak or homebrew ever for the iPhone, or for that matter, for like other types of secure hardware, like the 3DS or the Nintendo Switch, all of those hacks are based on buffer overflows in some way. They use at least one in there, generally. Um, very famous usage of it, the Morris worm, all the way back in 1988, it was considered the first major malware ever written, although it was not written maliciously at first by Robert Morris, who was a university student at the time. It was a self-replicating and self-propagating program, although it was not intentionally designed that way. Basically, it infected around 10% of the entire internet in less than 15 hours just by exploiting a buffer overflow in one machine, worming to that machine, and then installing itself on that machine. And then that machine was used as another pivot point for it to self-replicate to all the machines that that machine had access to. And it would just do that over and over and over again. And it exploited a buffer overflow in Windows specifically, specifically the SMB part of Windows, which is like a very old piece of software used for sharing data. Um, so that was pretty interesting. And actually, also interestingly, he foresaw that it would replicate too quickly. He wanted it to be kind of like a prank. He didn't want it to be like taking down valuable hardware systems and stuff. So he specifically made it so that the software only had a one in seven chance of replicating to another machine. There was a one in seven chance that every time it replicated to a machine, it would just stop. And like, that seems pretty conservative. Like that doesn't sound like a worm that would spread too much. But no, it infected 10% of the entire internet in less than 15 hours. So worms are dangerous, kids. Um, estimated financial cost of between 10000 to a $1 million just caused by the amount of downtime there was. It would self-propagate through the network and saturate connections and just take down all of these valuable systems, and that was not good. Um, there are modern mitigations, and I talked about this a little bit in an intermission earlier, against the buffer overflow exploit. Um, there's this thing called a stack smashing canary, which is basically a way to, it, it's something built into compilers. So while you can still write code with gets in it, when you go to compile it on a modern day compiler, on modern day like uh, GCC or something, um, GCC will insert protections into it so that if you actually use gets in a way that's exploitable, it will stop the execution of the program and report it, right? Um, now, the thing is, is that is something I had to disable in order to create the exercise for you today. There's like a flag you pass to the compiler to say, don't do that. Um, but there's tons of software that is old and hasn't been recompiled in years. So they are still vulnerable to those problems. Um, there's another mitigation called address space layout randomization. If you go back to that memory model that I created earlier, where you had like the input buffer right next to the password, ASLR for short is basically a way to make it so that even if you overflow the buffer, the odds of it affecting password is really low because it will just randomly put them in memory somewhere instead of right next to each other. It will try to randomize the address space layout. So it's a pretty reflective name. Um, and in fact, actually, both of these modern mitigations are built into you and I's computers today. Like if I go to the settings of Windows even, or if I go to security here, um, I should be able to open Windows Security. It's built right into most modern operating systems. Let's see here. 
maybe device security, uh, virus and threat protection. I disabled most of this. Oh, they kind of moved it. App and browser control. Isolated browsing. Exploit protection settings. Yes, here we go. So here you can see I'm not making this up. Here's a bunch of things that they do. Notice the phrase ASLR here. Um, it will force randomization of stuff. And also notice how a lot of this stuff is disabled by default. Um, but yeah, th these are stuff that's just built into the operating system nowadays to help prevent this kind of attack. But in reality, it only makes it slightly more difficult. Um, so what's the big idea, C? Why is it that you have such a problem with um, with this kind of buffer overflow problem? Like Java doesn't have any of these problems. But the thing is, you have to remember the languages of C and the languages of Java were written for different problems, right? Um, C was used to run code on a machine as efficiently as possible because if it spent extra time checking to make sure that you weren't overflowing a buffer, it would run too slow on a computer from like the 70s, right? Um, Java had the ability to be born in like 1997 where computers could afford to check buffers before they'd start writing to it without the user really noticing that slowdown. And so you really just have to keep that in mind. Um, don't be too hard on C. It's trying very hard. No language is inherently insecure, except for one. And I'm not going to talk about PHP as much as I usually do here. I'm actually just going to skip past this topic, but um, it's it's a fun thing. Anyways, uh, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I'm just going to wrap up. <laughs> so all in all, with the exception of PHP, software isn't really the problem. Basically, the slides I skipped were just like a tangent on how bad PHP is as far as security is concerned. But I'm just going to ignore that for now, because I think everyone who's still here has already seen that before. Um, and you'll get access to the slides later. So you can look at those at your own leisure. Um, with the exception of PHP, software isn't inherently the problem. Bad design is the problem. The programmer is the problem. When in doubt, PEDCAC which is an acronym that stands for the problem exists between the chair and the keyboard. And I think that's a philosophy that us, a lot of us as, um, yeah, a lot of us as computer science engineers and software engineers need to humbly remember when we have bugs in our code. Mitigations to these things exist. Problems don't have to keep being problems, but the problem is we have to be informed about them and keep making decisions towards avoiding these problems in the future. So, um, that was kind of my wrap up, I think. I just wanted to speed it up a little bit. If you have any questions, you're welcome to ask them in the chat. Um, I will say, let's see what's after this. I would like for you to, after I stop recording here, <laughs> <laughs>